Welcome to a new edition of the Neon Jazz Interview Series with Harlem-based jazz guitarist, vocalist, and composer Alan Harris on 2021's Kate's Soul Food CD. We talked to him at length on March 1st about this new CD and this COVID-19 world we are all living in. This new project is his 14th as a leader and is a spirited, soul-drenching 10-track recording that pays homage to his home of Harlem as only he can do it. We also talk about hope and the return to the proverbial stage enjoy joe what's up hey man <laughs> living through this weird thing called america 2021 <laughs> brother please let's not get into it oh man my God. Yeah, there's so much to say you know we don't have 20 hours <laughs> yeah i know man i guess the good thing I, I will tell you up front the beauty of what's going on in the world right now is, is the, the jazz guy i i keep getting cds in the mail i keep hearing quality music so i'm so happy to see you have a cd out and it, it really feels like it, you had a jubilant time making this album. I did, man. It was a labor of love and releasing a lot of pathos, childhood uh, yearnings and wants. It was really wonderful, man. Really wonderful time. Kate Soul Food. Talk to me a little bit about why this is personal and why it was such a good jazz conversation that got recorded on tape. Very good. Wow. Um came about because of my childhood listening to some incredible music and my mother and my aunt taking me up on the weekends to Harlem to their aunt, which is my great aunt's place in Harlem called Kate's Soul Food. I would sit there and just see some of the greats come in and order their food. And then after that, we'd venture around the corner to the Apollo where children got in free for matinees. And I see everyone from Duke Ellington to the Temptations to Sarah Bond, James Brown, Jackie Wilson, the list goes on and on. And I and I think that, that uh, permeated my mind, which I knew it did. And so I lived with that all my life. Little did I know it would fester and grow inside me, my heart and my mind. I decided this is a good time in, in my, my career to release something that really tells of what I was about. And that's how it came about, and I'm get I was gracious enough to get some incredible artists with me who helped make it come to life. You know, this year has probably been one of the most extreme times on earth. A lot of self reflection. Was this album an outgrowth of kind of taking that mirror and looking at yourself and figuring out the pieces of what made you who you are? It was, man. Not only did um it not only uh made me who I am, it also made me realize my place in all this uh, menagerie of cultural cultural things in America. Some of it good, you know, being a man of color, of course, this last summer has been hell for us. Um, yeah. So it's that to the forefront. And plus, the flip side of it is it was wonderful because of the contribution of the music of my forefathers and people before me, musician family and friends and loved ones who came before me laying down this incredible music from rock to jazz yeah that's it it's so easy for the human mind from a psychological standpoint to point 10 bad things out fast and it's it's it, i mean I, sh I should say it's easy for them to do that it's hard to come up with things that are good sometimes this year has been rough but my question to you is this with the way this has been so self-reflective and jubilant for this release what kind of hope do you have with this album being out in the world right now. How has this made you feel better about being alive on Earth? Well, it's made me feel better because now all of our foibles as a humankind, what we do to each other, how we interact, it's brought to the surface, good and the bad. And I'm really relying on the good faith of what's gotten us to this point right now, musically, that is. I feel that because all of this ugliness is being on earth it's always been under the surface but now everyone's aware of it even those who have denied it cannot deny it it's almost like the old saying uh don't believe your lying eyes well now you have to believe it and it i think we can look at the negative part of it and say oh man things look so bad because we've seen because of the internet because of the news we're exposed to a lot of stuff but it's always been here i think now that it's been exposed people are realizing that we have to come together and figure out how not just to make it right, but to make it comfortable for each other, because that's the only way we're going to interact. If 
each and every one of us feels that we have a place of comfort as we walk side by side. And music has been my catalyst in doing that. But now I see it, it's, it's transcended into other arenas, too. You know, there's a lot of people that I've spoken with over this pandemic, and I think when it started and was kind of raging into the summer and fall, it was, you know, you got an album that came out, and you can't do any live touring. And it's mm -hmm. kind of evolved into this notion that now, in 2021, at this particular time, releasing material is almost like doing live gigs. It almost seems more cathartic now to do it. It is, because uh, from the artist's viewpoint, you can become a little uh, tainted because you can take your audience for granted when you tour as much as I do and as others. It becomes almost rote, you know, when you're doing 200 plus dates, whatever. Uh, you, be, you can almost take your audience for granted. You become almost, uh, uh, you do the same thing at each concert and see the uh, smiling faces, and you almost take it for granted. This pandemic has done a lot of soul searching because now when we come out of this as performers and as artists in whatever arena you're in, we're more appreciative, not just of our audiences and the people who buy records and come to our shows, we're more appreciative of our place in front of them. It's almost, I am, I'm grateful of the gift of having them accept me on stage because, you know, you have a tendency to take it for granted, you know, and this has been, this pandemic has really made me look into the, like you said, look into the mirror as myself as an individual and say, I'm really grateful to these people who want to hear me and to include my song and my voice into their life. What do you miss the most from that old world from last year? What is it that you've been longing to get back to? The embrace of my fellow man from the stage. You know, I'm doing a lot of streaming, but I have to pretend that there's people in the camera lens, so I have to call upon those um, memories of what it's like to play in front of 100, 500,000 people. That's what I miss. I miss the interaction, because, especially as a vocalist, there's times in the evening where your imagination and the way, you, uh, way I run my show is based upon how my audience is interacting with me. You know, should I go here? Should I go there? I mean, I've changed songs in the middle of a set just based upon how my audience is feeling at that moment. They, we don't have that liberty now with this pandemic. You just have to pretend that something's happening, and you get a chat room, which isn't the same as looking at someone who's swooning or holding their loved one or smiling on stage or laughing or clapping. I miss that a lot. I can't wait for that comes back into vogue. From a hopeful standpoint here, as the world starts kind of awakening, there's, there's little things that are starting to kind of happen. How do you see 2021 unfolding and even into next year with you getting back on stage and the world of live music coming back? I feel that, the, that every one of us now is, has become more aware of this gift of, um, of interaction with each other, this gift of music, this gift of sharing ideas, this gift of sharing culture which is missing when you're locked at home just with your one family and you don't know what's, you have no idea what next door is doing or down the street or across the hill or across the pond. I see people are going to look at each other in a different light and we're going to breathe a sigh of relief and just embrace each other much more warmly than we have in so many years. I mean, there was a time where you would go to a club and sit there and that was... That's how you geared your whole week to that one day in the club. You didn't take it for granted. Now, with the Internet, with music online, that you, you, we as an audience member, and I'm putting myself in the audience for a minute, we've uh, taken it for granted. We got spoiled. Now that we're, really, we're realizing now that we missed that human interaction, that feeling of seeing and touching and enjoying what an artist or a performer is doing on this stage, and I, when when this breaks, when I hope it does by the summertime, I feel the audience is going to be a little more reticent and a little more, um, I couldn't say the word grateful. That's not fair to say grateful. Just more welcoming. Yes. I agree. I know I'm starving for it. Alan, thank you for taking a minute out. Good luck oh. with the album and the return to stage. It's always great to talk to you. Thank you, brother. Thanks for listening and tuning in to another Neon Jazz interview where we give you a bit of insight into the finest players and singers in Harlem, Kansas City, and spots all over the world giving fans all that jazz. And thanks to Alan for his time, music, and story. 
you want to hear more interviews, go to Famous Interviews with Joe Domino in the iTunes Store. Visit Neon Jazz at YouTube.com. And for everything Neon Jazz all the time, go to the neonjazz.blogspot.com. Until next time, enjoy the jazz, my friends. Neon Jazz.